So I just say would, we welcome everyone and um, th for this celebration of the Western Button Factory. During the presentation, I'd like to give a brief over overview of the history of the factory using newspaper archives, internet sources, and in particular, Dominic Rooney's article published in the Leitrim Guardian in 2016. In researching the day-to-day -day life of the factory, I was fortunate to be able to meet with and interview several former employees, most of whom were women, but who of course then were young girls. I also talked to Patrick and Patty Coyle, whose family had a long association with the factory and who continue to operate Melvin Plastics in the Button Factory premises to this day. I first of all like to talk to you about the origin of buttons. Where did buttons come from? Who was the first person to come up with the, is this essential part of modern clothing? The Indus Valley civilization in the Pakistan region is credited with the invention of the button, the earliest date being from approximately 2000 BC. Buttons were used as ornamental embellishments to a person's garment and signified wealth and status. Over the centuries, the button evolved from an embellishment to a more practical item. In the Middle Ages, the buttonhole or hole in the fabric was invented. This allowed the button to pass through an opening and be slotted firmly in place, thus creating dependable fasteners for clothing. The wealthy wore buttons made of ivory or precious metals with jewels inlaid. The less wealthy wore buttons made of bone, wood, sometimes with fabric covering them. Uh, there was no indigenous button in manufacturing industry in Ireland in the 1930s. Prior to that, buttons were imported from Great Britain, particularly Birmingham, which was the centre of the button making industry in the UK. A free trade policy existed between Ireland and the UK until the mid 1930s, but this was about to change as Ireland's manufacturing industry collapsed after the Great Depression in the 1930s. The Irish government was forced to introduce policies to help the manufacturing industry. Sean Lemass, as Minister for Industry and Commerce in the Fianna Fáil government, imposed tariffs on imported goods, including a 75% tariff on buttons, and at the same time introduced grants and loans to Irish industrialists to help establish native industries. With these incentives now available, two new button factories opened in Dublin. Meanwhile, a group of Fianna Fáil politicians led by Ben Maguire TD were exploring the possibility of opening a button factory in the Sligo Leitrim constituency. This was 1935 and by 1936 some North Leitrim businessmen had agreed to invest in the venture and to form a company to manufacture buttons and combs. The new company was registered in 1937 and an announcement in the Irish Independent newspaper dated the 20th of January 1937 stated that the Western Button Factory would be situated in Manor Hamilton. There was competition from other towns in the constituency. The <coughs> Pardon. I don't think I have. Uh, have I got it, Mark? Can, can you hear me? No, no. Sorry. We don't. Hugh Dolan, Hardware Shop Manor Hamilton, George Wilson, Draper Manor Hamilton, Ben Maguire, TD Glenfarn, Patrick Dolan, Hardware and Provision Merchant Drumkeern, Stephen Durham, Solicitor Sligo, were the original shareholders. They bought 100 one pound shares each and were appointed the first directors. The option to buy further shares in the company was extended to the public and 20 locals responded. These investors included businessmen, farmers, and at least two women, Mrs. Healy and Mrs. Carty. The total cash amounted to over 5,000 old pounds, equivalent to over 41,000 euro in today's money. P.L. Coyle businessman was appointed company secretary and took a leading role in the promotion and establishment of the factory. He later became a shareholder. Now we'll talk about the building and equipping of the factory. 
Mr. William Hazlett and son, that would be Oliver's grandfather, was given the contract to build the factory and the manager's house. An immediate requirement, however, was expertise to get the factory up and running. This necessitated the appointment of a technical advisor. As it happened, a German button expert, Mr. Ernest Krauss, was already in the country in connection with the establishment of a factory in Belfast. He was immediately persuaded to come to Manor Hamilton. And as announced in the Irish Independent in January 1937, Ernest Krauss, a German national, was appointed manager and technical advisor. He had come from the centre of the button manufacturing in Germany and had acquired much experience throughout Europe setting up button factories. A Dublin firm did the steel construction and a German factory supplied and installed the most up-to-date button making machinery. The building was, when complete, was 4,000 square feet. It was clean and spacious with lots of natural light. There were modern toilets and hand-washing facilities, which didn't exist in many of the houses of the employees at that time. Mr. Krauss and his wife took up residence in the manager's house when the factory was built. Now we talk about training and recruitment of staff. It was arranged with Leitrim Vocational Education Committee through PL Coyle that classes in button making would be made available in Manor Hamilton. A technical school while the factory was being constructed. Ernest Krauss would give tuition for 12 hours per week in the making and dyeing of buttons to 20 prospective employees. Training would continue in the new factory once the equipment was installed there. And we have a slide uh, <coughs> at that stage, just a newspaper announcement talking about the coming up at the VEC meeting about Mr. Krauss training the, the employees in, in the tech. Um, along with the manager, other staff included Deputy Manager Anthony Farrell, recruited from the UK, but with Rosinva roots. Pat Mitchell, machine maintenance and later foreman. Milo Travers, Glenn Farn, who was in the dining room and packing area. Peter and Barnigal Murray, mechanics. Tom Coyle, office and sales. Eileen McGovern, office. Nan Gilgon, Nimonda, Cardine area. Staff worked from 8.45 to 5.45 Monday to Friday, and if there was a rush to complete an order, overtime was available to some workers. These employees worked from 6 to 8 on weekdays, with additional hours on Saturday evenings. There was a tea break at 11, and lunch was one hour, and there was two weeks' holidays in the summer. Most girls on the production line started at 16 years. They were interviewed by Anthony Farrell, deputy manager. By 1941, pay was eight old shillings per week, with an extra for overtime, and there were about 40 employees. This money made a significant difference to families. Mary Fox recalls being able to buy the week's groceries and have money left over to buy something for herself. There were instances of girls being encouraged to leave school to work in the factory because the money was needed at home. And if they hadn't gone to the factory, they would most likely have emigrated to the UK. When Margaret Lee, that's Mary's sister, emigrated to England in the 1950s, she told me there were 14 people from around this area on the boat also emigrating. And we have a slide there of the very early employees. I'm sorry, it's a poor quality, but right here in the front, a small little person, is the said Mary Lee, Mary Fox. She's right in the front. Right there. The right front. And about four, I can recognise, the fourth in from the left is Madge Farrell, and the, lo the girl in the long white coat is a very young Flory Sharp. Uh, yeah. Now, I had to get a magnifying glass at that to, to make it out. <coughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I really must have that, I should have had it restored, really. Lots of girls from the town were employed. Names included Summers, McSharry, Waldron, Rooney, Farrell, McTiernan, Gilmurray, to name but a few. Girls also came from Drummer Hare, Glen Carr, Glen Fern, and all around. And the boys came from Drum Kieran, Killargy, Drummer Hare, as well as the town. By the end of 1937, the factory was doing well, having captured a good slice of the Irish market. 
A report from the Leitrim Observer stated that production has now reached a satisfactory stage and this achievement is remarkable. That was in a very short time. Now we'll now go on to the production and I have a slide kind of which is again it's not great. It shows the girls at the, at the machines with the belts overhead and we've kind of just with conjecture decided that the man in the background is probably Ernest Krauss. Uh, the factory was driven by a diesel engine which turned an overhead shaft. A series of belts from the shaft powered the manually operated machines. The original raw material used in 1937 to make buttons was called corozo. It was a Brazilian nut, also known as an ivory nut. They were, these were described as about the size of apples. They came in 100 weight bags and were very hard to cut. They had a white center and could be shaped and dyed and polished. During World War II, of course, the Brazilian nut could not be imported and a replacement raw material had to be found. This reply, uh, replacement was ca called casein and it was a byproduct of milk. It was a hard synthetic resin and was produced in Ireland by Cork, North Cork Co-op. This came in sheets which were soaked overnight by camel moor. The softened sheets were then cut into buttons of varying sizes. Holes were drilled and rough edges trimmed. The dyeing and polishing took place in barrels. The polishing barrels contained sawdust and small sticks were filled in the evening with the buttons and were rotated all night. There were various shapes and colours of buttons with either four or two holes or none. Names of buttons included shanks and fish eyes. The shank had an attachment at the back which enabled it to be stitched to the garment. And again, we have an illustration of this. That's just a box of buttons from Manor Hamilton. And as you see, they did all kinds of sizes, shapes, all kinds of colors. And that's Mary Lee's box of buttons. And uh, on the next one, on the, on the left hand side, that's my left, is the shank buttons, which had no hole and had a little bar at the back, which you could sew on to the the material and on this side is what they call the fish eyes and they have like a little depression in the center with two holes. They're the fish eye buttons. In the morning the polished buttons were removed from the barrels, checked for quality and sorted into their various sizes and types. They were then sent to the carding room where they were then either sewn on cards or placed in smallish boxes with one button sewn on the outside indicating the content. Large boxes were packed for dispatch and Anthony McMiniman remembers carrying the boxes out to a van for the post office. They were posted. Now we talk about the war years. The outbreak of World War II in 1939 caused what could have been a disastrous outcome for production in the factory as diesel stocks dried up. To maintain production, the factory management made the decision to acquire a heavy steam engine, from which a belt was fed through a hole in the factory wall from outside and attached to the overhead shaft. Ideally, this engine should have been driven by coal, but again, due to the war, it too was scarce. So large quantities of locally sourced turf was used. Sacks of turf were built and patched at the factory as this slide illustrates. And there you have a big sack of turf attached uh, and roped and several factory employees there in front. Remember, at this time, rural electrification had not come. As it turned out, the use of the turf helped the local economy too. It provided further employment in the area as did the transportation of the turf to the factory. Nine years after the factory opened, it finally got a reliable supply of power as rural electrification came to Manor Hamilton in 1946 and the ESB became the new supplier to the factory. The era of reliance on diesel and turf was over. We'll now talk about just the day-to-day -day life. Initially, people walked to work. But within a short time, transport to work for most employees was the bicycle, which was bought in Fees of Glenfern or Bernie Connolly's in Manor Hamilton. Later still, if you were from Glenfern, Milo Travers had a car. 
and for two and sixpence per week, he would provide a lift to work. During the big snowfall in 1947, people had to walk to work with heaps of snow either side of them. That snow came in February and it didn't melt until May. Mr. Krauss, who was the German manager, was a stickler for time. He stood at the entrance door in the morning with a bell, and if you saw him outside, you knew you were late. He introduced a system to discourage latecomers, whereby he only paid at one o'clock, from one o'clock, a half day. But he must have also been flexible and had in mind the interests of the workers. Margaret Lee recalls that Mr. Krauss got them yellow oilskin capes as protection from the rain when cycling to work. She said they all looked like a bunch of yellow canaries leaving the factory at the end of their shift. What a pity we haven't got a photograph of that. <laughs> and as Mary also recalls, he never objected when Myra Carty came for her to help in their restaurant on a busy fair day. Myra Carty's mother was a shareholder, of course. And I have a slide of Carty's, actually. That's, that was Carty's. They didn't actually own the pub at the time that we're talking about. They did later. But the restaurant was upstairs. So Mary remembers running up and down those stairs with plates full of dinner. <laughs> it seems he also had a sense of humour. Because when Mary went to the manager's office after 10 years to tell him she was leaving, he greeted her as follows. Is it a birth, a marriage, or a death? She was leaving to get married um, and had to resign her job as married women were not allowed to work. Employees recalled the long days standing on coal floors, the trips to the boiler room to get warmed up, no sneaking to the toilet for smoke. Despite this, in those early days, workers appeared content. Some saying it was a happy place to work and that they sang all day. There was no canteen as such, but there was an area squared off where lunch was eaten. Flory Sharp was remembered with affection as she boiled the kettle for staff at break time. And Mrs. Krauss made mince pies for everyone at Christmas. And we have a slide of Mrs. showing Mrs. Krauss. Mrs. Krauss is the second in with the cat and her friend is on the other side. And on the back of that photo, it said, Anthony Farrell Senior and Family. So I gather that must be Anthony Farrell's parents, and I'm not sure which of the young men at the back was Anthony Farrell. Um, so we'll now talk about health and safety, and I'll have to have another drop of water, please. <laughs> Now, health and safety rules, as we know them today, did not exist then. Moving belts, which operated the machines, overhead were extremely dangerous. An employee had to be very quick and careful when drilling holes in the buttons of all different sizes. Margaret Lee told me a story of getting the drill in her finger one day. She went to Mr. Krause's office. He just pulled it out, placed a bandage on the wound and chastised her by saying, now Margaret, if you were paying attention to your work, that would not have happened. <laughs> Another hazard was that small pieces of very hot plastic resin could get into the eye during the dr drilling process, causing a burning sensation. The hot plastic also emitted a very strong smell. A feature of the working conditions was that there was a lot of dust in the atmosphere. In fact, in 1960, the Leitrim Observer gives a report of a case taken by an employee against the Western Button Factory and this person was awarded £125 compensation in the circuit court, having been diagnosed by Dr. McNally in Mercer's Hospital, Dublin, as having severe asthma as a result of grinding machines emanating dust consisting of chemicals, sawdust and other materials causing a haze of dust all round the room. She was no longer able to work. Many employees received first aid training with the Red Cross during the war years in the 1940s. Flory Sharp, Annie Farr, later Rooney, Nan Munda, later Gilgon, and Madge Farrell were among those who acquired this training. This, of course, was very advantageous for the company since they were able to apply their first aid skills in the factory and they then became the go-to persons for accidents. 
Now, we hear a lot of talk about the word carding from the factory. And as described already, the buttons were sewn on cards in the factory. But if it was be very busy and there was a rush on, employees were encouraged to do this work at home in the evening. One woman recalls walking home a fair distance with the heavy box of cards and buttons and the fear of the rain coming. The sewing was also given out to numerous private houses in the town as piecework. Eileen McGovern distributed the cards and buttons in the town. And in my own case, Eileen was our neighbour. And the early 1960s, she, she suggested that we take on this task to earn some extra money. But she, of course, she suggested that to my mother. But we, as young teenagers, hated the job. And after a short time, we persuaded our mother not to take any more cards. And we have a slide here of the buttons on the cards. There they are. It was tedious work. And the social, uh, there was a great social scene, of course, around the factory. The social club was a very important aspect of life in the factory. Pat Mitchell and Eileen McGovern were instrumental in setting up the social club in the 1940s. And we have here a slide of the first dance in McSharry's Hall in 1947. The club arranged dances and outings and dinner dances. There were outings to Dublin, Belfast and Bundorna and other places. And we have a photograph of, of a dance in Madlone's Hall. That's a group uh, at the... Um, and um, they were held in Madlone's Hall, also known as McSharry's Hall, which is where DM, DM Auctions is now. Uh, in the later years, a Christmas dinner dance was organised in the hotel and Georgie Thompson provided entertainment playing the piano. And we have a slide now of an outing with Georgie Thompson there. And we looked at this slide, I discussed it with Harold, and we think this slide looks like an outing to the seaside, probably Bundorn. During the war, fuel was scarce, so transport for an outing would have been difficult to obtain. <coughs> Thompson's garage had three cars with Hackney licenses, which allowed them to get extra fuel and evidently these cars were hired for this outing and Georgie was one of the drivers. And we actually have a photo of the three Hackney cars at Thompson's and that's Jimmy Thompson, Harold's grandfather, there standing in front. We now come to a change of management. And we actually have a slide of a dance, I think the dinner dance maybe, yeah, that uh, Ger Mitchell shared with me. Hodge Fihili and S Margaret Clancy and other girls. That was, that was later a dinner dance, I think. After 17 years as manager, ably assisted by Anthony Farrell, Mr. Krauss resigned in 1953. He and his wife emigrated to the USA. He was replaced by Percy Wade, a native of Birmingham. This appointment was influenced by Buttons Limited Birmingham, who had made a substantial investment in the Western Button Company by this time. Birmingham, as I've already stated, was the centre of the button manufacture in England. Percy Wade and his wife moved into the manager's house and quickly settled in the area, becoming involved in lots of sporting activities, including angling and table tennis. In fact, he set up a table tennis club in the factory for the workers who played there at night. During his tenure as manager, a large extension was added to the factory in 1957 and the production lines expanded to include folding alloy chairs, tables, recliners, and suitcase racks for hotel rooms. Unfortunately for the Western Button Factory, Percy Wade returned to England due to ill health in 1966. The factory in Birmingham did not supply a replacement for Mr. Wade, and in fact, they withdrew their investment from the factory. This was an extremely worrying time for the directors, but they were determined to keep the factory open. That determination meant they secured training in the Birmingham factory for the foreman, Pat Mitchell. From 1966 to 1972, the factory was jointly managed by Pat Mitchell and Eileen McGovern. They made every effort to promote the factory. And in 1968, a stand displaying the manufactured products from the Western Button Company at the Sligo Leitrim exhibition in the National Development Premises on 3 Stephen Street, Dublin, was organised by them and P.L. Coyle. 
the factory closed on the 1st of September 1972 with the loss of 18 jobs. Yes, employee numbers had fallen from the average of 40 over the lifetime of the factory. Many factors led to its closing, but the invention and convenience of the zip and competition from cheap imports were the main reasons. It is also clear that the failure to modernize was a major factor. It was time for change and for new processes in manufacturing. According to Pat Coyle, the installation of injectant molding equipment might have increased the potential of the factory to plan a future strategy. But that wasn't to be. And now we have the winding up and the sale. During the winding up process, there was a clearance and sale of machinery and stock. The remaining manufactured, but manufactured buttons were bought by a company called Smallwares in Castle Bellingham in Louth. This company was also a button factory. The, this was a business decision by Smallwares to prevent a flood of buttons coming onto the market and thus reducing the price of buttons. From recollections I've been told, there was an awful lot of buttons, which were packed in numerous tea chests, placed on a large truck and trailer, and transported by Cullen Haulage to Castle Bellingham in Louth. That truck was driven by Seamus Cullen, ably assisted by Johnny Rankin. When if button manufacturing in Manor Hamilton came to an end after 36 years, it had provided essential employment in the area and contributed handsomely to the household budget when money was scarce. The foresight of the politicians and the businessmen who provided this industry in Manor Hamilton should be remembered. The factory now houses Melvin Plastics, which is owned and managed by P.L. Coyle's nephew, Patrick. Tom Coyle, father of Patrick, bought the empty factory after it closed and moved his business there in 1975. 45 years later, Melvin Plastics is still operational. And we just show the last few slides um, of just, you have Eileen McGovern in the middle and Bernadette Banks here and one of the Clancy girls, I think. And Ger Mitchell shared these with me. And a lovely one of the Clancy girls. And there's one more maybe. Yeah, with Camel Moore, uh, Margaret Clancy and Anna McHugh, and Margaret Clancy again. So that's the end of my talk, but I'd like to just thank you, every, uh, so many people to thank. I owe a big thank you to numerous people whose recollections and knowledge helped me so much in putting this story together. Former employees welcomed me to their homes and gave of their time freely. These included Mary Fox, and her sister Margaret, Nan Kerrigan, Rose Connolly, Pat Feely, Bernadette Banks, Anthony McMiniman, and Anna Clancy. Thank you to Anne Kelly, Philomena Rooney, and Ger Mitchell for sharing photographs, Harold Thompson and Seamus Cullen, and Johnny Rankin, Anne Dolan, Vincent Gilgon, Donna Gilligan, who invited me to give the talk, and Assumpta Kelly of the Women's Centre. This presentation is only a, shap, a snapshot in time. I'm conscious that it doesn't include all the names or all the memories of this important era of life in Manor Hamilton, but it will have revived some and maybe stimulated others and add to the store of memorabilia. All I can then add that can be added to this story is, I, I did show you those photographs. Um, there's one little aside which I, I meant to include and forgot. When I was speaking to Mary Lee about what they did, besides going to dances and things, they went to the cinema. And I was in touch with Harold, and he was able to produce the very first uh, program for the cinema. And I'm not sure, Harold, if I have it here with me now. The very first picture was, you know, Harold, <laughs> the name. <laughs> <laughs> a film with Rita Hayworth, wasn't it? Yes. And um, they, you know, it, it went on for five nights. It was a series like we watch now on television, you know. And I did hear another story, which I might share with you, if you don't mind. I only heard it this week. Um, I was out with Bernadette Banks and she had recalled this story and I thought it was very good. 
she said she worked in the office with Eileen McGovern. And one summer she was asked to work, continue working. And she was tidying. And she saw a box of buttons under Eileen's desk. And she thought, what are they doing there? And she dumped them. And when Eileen came back, Eileen was looking for the buttons. And she said, where did the buttons go? And Bernadette said, well, I dumped them. Oh my God, she said, they were the first buttons ever manufactured here. That's why I kept them. So she said, I was in the bad books for a number of weeks after that. So Shinny, that's the story. Um, uh, the first they were blank and then they were brought to the machine and uh, there, there was a design made on the machines and then they were brought away then drilled four holes and maybe there was the chunk then the little holes at the back and uh, and the fish's eye, there was another one they called the fish eye. And what was the one with the bar at the back? What? Fish eye. Yeah, the other one though with no hole. What did they call that one? With no hole. The shank, was it? The yes. The shank? yes, yes, yeah. And did you do many different colours, Mary? Oh, different colours, they were all colours of the day. And different sizes? Yes, different sizes, yeah. but some, then we had to separate the sizes. Right. Yes. And did you ever sew buttons on cars? No, I never. I was for separating the colours and the sizes and, and them yes, and uh, patching bags. <laughs> they used to get <laughs> uh, they used to get the saw dust, you know, for, to put in through the buttons. That's right. But the there'd bars. be some of these very loose bags, you know, there'd be little and Pat Mitchell always. That was my job for to patch them. To patch them. I was. Right. A, and pack a needle and thread and put on your patch, and just you like, a, like on trousers. And were you patching the bags? Aye, aye. Oh, right, he'd okay. Maybe he'd want three dozen or four. Three dozen? Aye. Oh, right. aye. Well, well to get sawdust back. Okay. Aye. okay. Yeah, yeah. And after a while they'd get worn and they'd get a hole in them, would they? Yes. Yeah. Our oh, times has changed. <laughs> times has changed. So you were ten years there, weren't you? Yes, yeah. ten years. And you, you got a, you got a big wedding present, I suppose, when you left. Oh, I lovely <laughs> set of china, all right. Did you? I did. Good. Yes. Good. Yeah. From the factory. Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. Everyone that left always got something. <laughs>